Uh, we we will try, I understand, uh, in, in this session, or at least myself, to dwell more on cultural history, as you could see from the text that I choose. And I, I really want to try, at least, to, uh, through this text, to, to see what really changed in this period, especially in the 16th and 17th centuries from former periods, uh, and uh, whether this is, uh, in a way, really not just a different uh, period in terms of time, but also in terms of its contents and its characteristics. Uh, in my opinion, what differ uh, to differentiate the early modern period from the Middle Ages we have to point to a structure or a different character of Jewish society to justify this differentiation. Since major changes and developments occurred during the course of any given century, my idea was to examine these centuries and look for a wide-scale change that altered Jewish life in a way that left or leaves no doubt about its different character. In other words, while searching a text, I choose not a typical text, but I prefer to look on a text which expresses a deep change from one side and from the other side, which influenced a Jewish society and Jewish culture in the 17th century, and it altered it in a way that I might even say that if a person from the 15th century would enter a synagogue in the 17th century, uh, then he might have felt very strange, or even as a stranger. I could compare it like, uh, you know, entering a, a a church and not understanding the mass at all, or what's going on in that church. In my opinion, the change in the synagogue, on the change in Jewish religious life from the 16th century on was so deep that it really, it's, it's, it's a totally different cultural and religious experience. Now, uh, I will try uh, to do this mainly through the sex the text by by pointing to certain points and then getting back to larger uh, observations but probably uh, i have to uh, to make an introduction about the setting of all of this because i assume since as i see the people here and i know some of of their work they are not very familiar with the ottoman empire so uh, it seems that it, it will pay it to, to say some words of introduction on that. Uh, now, I hope that I, that I don't like too much my topic and I don't make the Ottoman Empire too important. But in my opinion, the Jewish society in, in the Ottoman Empire, at least in the 16th century, is the biggest in number. No question about that. We have documentation for that. But if, if we talk on a community like Constantinople, which is Istanbul, in fact, not Constantinople, but everybody calls it Constantinople. Anyway, we talk on a community which its size is between 30 to, to 40,000 Jews. I don't think that there is anything close to that anywhere at that period. Or if we talk in a community like Salonika, we talk between 15 to 20,000 Jews, 60% of the city Jewish. Even a small community like Safed, and, and the text is from Safed here, we talk about a community around 8,000 people. You know, even in the 20th century, Safed, the Jewish community of Safed, it took a long time to proclaim that Safed is a city. It needed 10,000 people to make it a city. And it took like 20 years in Israel uh, to have it. So we have, a, I'm not talking about Cairo or Damascus or other big or 
Aleppo or other big Jewish or later on Izmir, we talk here about a, a, a very populated uh, Jewish society, which in itself is not uh, culturally a, a very important uh, point, but still it means that it is a striving Jewish community with a, 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 a very solid uh, economic basis and a very developed uh, system of organization and uh, which is not, uh, you know, uh, if compared with any other Jewish community at that period in terms of numbers, in term terms of striving, and even in terms of uh, cultural production, there is no comparison at all. Uh, I would say that hundreds of, of books uh, written and printed by these scholars uh, most contemporary Jewish uh, uh, scholarship at that period is from the Ottoman Empire. If we check the printing houses in Italy, it's like from 80 to 90 percent of the contemporary uh, uh, writings, I'm not talking printing Maimonides or whatever, whatsoever, but writers from the 16th century 80 to 90 percent are from the Ottoman Empire and not from Italy and not from Poland and not from anywhere else. This is the situation of the 16th century. We cannot ignore it. This is uh, truly important. And we can talk even on the level of the scholarship or, uh, and that too, uh, I think, cannot be uh, 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 in any way uh, put aside. So therefore, in my opinion, any, any notion about the early modern period at that time has to take uh, into consideration strongly things that are happening in the Ottoman Empire. Now, the other point is, and that's the reason why I choose a Kabbalistic text, and especially from the school of the Lurianic Kabbalah, is the fact that in my opinion, the most important change in the religiosity and in the, in the cultural activity of Jewish society at large in the world, not just in the Ottoman Empire, in the 16th and the 17th century is the transformation of the religiosity and culture of Jewish society all over by the Lurianic Kabbalah. That's, in my opinion, the major cultural and religious event. So, and it happened voluntarily. It started in Safed, but then it spread all over. If you look everywhere, even in Eastern Europe and Poland and Lithuania, and not just to Central Europe or to the Ottoman Empire, na naturally. This is the basic change, and it, it's a major change. Now, let us look uh, first to the text. In my opinion, first of all, we have to take a look in the first section of the text, because it reveals the time, and the time is, not, uh, is, is very important to, for understanding this text. It says clearly that it was written when Chaim Vital was 30 years of age, quite young, relatively, and uh, uh, very shortly after, the, uh, after Luria, the Ari passed away. His feeling of crisis or all this introduction in the first section has to do with Luria's passing away, although he's not stating it explicitly. He says it later. But it's clear that his mood is, uh, you know, is not, uh, he's not very glad and he's in a kind of, uh, because the Ari passed away. Now, this is very important since the end of the introduction also has to do 
with the appearance of Ari and his passing away. And also the connotation of the appearance of the Ari on the historical scene as part of a larger scheme of, of looking at this period as a messianic era. Messianic era in the connotation that the true Torah will be a, a, a known and will appear on the historical scene as part of the messianic scene, not that they think about something uh, real messianic at this point. But their feeling is that any, any fulfillment of a messianic period has to do with the revelation of the true and the deep secret of the Torah. And according to their feeling that the Aris uh, teaching and his Torah is the true Torah and it reveals the real secrets of the Torah. So there is a coincidence between these two points. Okay? So uh, the fact that the Ari passed away is in a way a kind of crisis. But uh, Vital is not very uh, open about that in the first section, or maybe he didn't yet uh, truly, uh, you know, understood the point because this was very shortly after uh, his passing away. Now, uh, uh, Luria was in Safed less than two years. This, this is a known fact. And all, uh, uh, all this process of the Luriani Kabbalah taking over is a very rapid process. The first point that I would like to point to is uh, the attitude of uh, Chaim Vital to Jewish society at large and to uh, Talmudic Chachamim, Talmudic scholars, and to Kabbalistic scholars and teachings. In the English text, page six, in the third section, it says the nation, the nation of Israel is comprised of three categories of people. The first category consists of the ignorant masses. Now, the very formulation of this sentence means that uh, Vital is probably very aristocratic in his attitude, like dividing the whole uh, nation of the Jewish people into three categories. One category is the uh, uh, ignorant masses, the other category is the Talmudic scholars, and the third category is the Kabbalists. So that makes the multitude of Jewish people ignorant masses, I would say. Now this happens all, all, also later on, which means that his face is not turned toward the masses at this point. Writing this introduction, the, his intention is to to talk with the intellectuals or with the scholars and not this is not intent to be published for the public and in fact this book was not published till as, as, as a book this manuscript was published only at the beginning of the 19th century it took quite a long time to publish this book now uh, still and this was not the attitude later on in those Kabbalistic circles. Therefore, I emphasize that this is written in 1572, and it is written to a certain layer of society, a certain group of people who are all intellectuals, scholars of, of Jewish law and Jewish mysticism. And this is not intended to be read by by the whole public, probably. Now, what he says here, and he starts at this point, is he criticizes strongly Talmidei uh, Chachamim, people of Torah, all along, in many pages here. If you will look, and now I have to change all the numbers, naturally. 
Uh, if you look all over into the uh, uh, into this introduction, you will see that the criticism is from I would say from this page on till the end of the introduction, and the criticism is uh, not just on the personality of these people; it's much more on the fact that they concentrate in Talmudic studies. In my opinion, this in itself is outrageous in a medieval society. It's almost impossible in a medieval society to attack a society and scholars of Torah that they engulf in Talmudic study. That's very strange. One of the major denominators of Jewish society and Jewish culture is the basis of the Talmudic uh, uh, culture and the Babylonian Talmud especially. We have criticism against this concentration in Talmudic studies and forgetting other parts of Jewish life or ethics or biblical study or whatsoever. That's, that's prevalent in the medieval society. We have it all over. Not too much, but it's there. But we don't have that much. A criticism of the study of the Babylonian Talmud as a religious endeavor or as a, a basis for Jewish law and Jewish spirituality. You don't have that. What you have is much more the fact that they concentrate only on the Bible, in the study of the Talmud, that they stop to study Bible. The Sephardi Jewish uh, uh, scholars, like Abarbanel or many others, say Ashkenazi people are terrible. Why? Because they study Bible, but then at the age of 10, they stop. There's a, and, a strand of Ashkenazi criticism, like the Maharal. Sure, the same thing. But even before that, right. yes? Now, what I am saying is that here we have a trend which says that it is wrong to concentrate in Talmudic studies because the Talmud itself, if you understand it plainly, it is not the real Torah. It's only the shell of the Torah, the external uh, 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 the external, uh, how do you say it, uh, the external facet of the Torah. It is not the real Torah. Nobody says that. The Kane would criticize the, the Talmudic scholars for, because they study Torah not in the right way, which means that they are, uh, that they are, uh, putting all their uh, efforts in, um, in logical or in uh, formal understanding of the law without understanding its inner meaning. That's, that's, that looks almost the same. But here you don't have that notion that here they say you should study Torah because you have to, to know the laws of the Torah. You, sorry, you should study Talmud to understand the Jewish law. But if you stop there, that's even, it is, not, it is not just not enough, but it's worse than that. Because it is a, a, like even helping the evil powers in the world because it strengthens the shell. Which is, uh, uh, which strengthens the evil side of deity. Is he saying that about the Talmud or the Torah in general? No, he says it about the Talmud, not about the Torah in general. He says it about the Talmudic and the Mishnah. He calls it Mishnah, but Mishnah here means Talmud too. He doesn't make any differentiation between Mishnah and Talmud. For him. Uh -huh. 
but he is not talking about biblical studies. He is not meaning that. He is meaning when he talks about Torah study, he means the halachic study. That's what he means. No, he is not referring to biblical studies all over in the whole introduction. You can't find anything about biblical studies. He takes it for granted that Bible is studied. You know, he looks at 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 this when he talks about Torah, he means uh, uh, halachic study and the Torah shabal pe. He is not really he is not really alluding to biblical studies. There is no such there is no such a concept. Uh, at that period, why? Because the biblical study is understanding Bible according to the Torah Shebaal Peh, to the oral law. There is no a different field of biblical studies. No, no, no. no but he calls them Kat Chachmei HaPshat. If you use the word Pshat, yeah, that's but a code pshat, word for biblical but studies. No, no. Not in this introduction. Pshat here is a understanding Bible according to oral law according to Midrash, according to Talmud, and not Pshat in the meaning of the Spanish scholars who, uh, like Radak, who made, understood the Bible according to the Pshat, according to its to the lingual, the, uh, 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 literal meaning. That's not his... Pshat here means superficial rather than... Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> non kabbalistic no. non kabbalistic non kabbalistic it's non kabbalistic understanding is pshat everything which is non kabbalistic is pshat one sec nicha that it is non kabbalistic but how do you know that it's talmudic as opposed to people who are not saying the inner truth of the Kabbal of the biblical text why do you sense, apply it to the, the talmud that rashi is considered the great Ashtan because what, what does he do he brings in essential form, the uh, uh, rabbinic interpretation of the no, 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 no. But Yossi's trying to make a different case. He's trying to make a case for an attack specifically on halachic study of Talmud. I will get to that explicitly. I don't see that in this. Just, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, then I will have to, to, to point to certain citations and uh, we will do that. And anyway, what what we have here is uh, he is not attacking like like uh, other medieval or or maharal or others who are attacking a certain he does it only once in in this introduction the way that people study talmud like the the in this case the sephardi way which is iyun they call it iyun which boyarin worked on and dimitrovsky before boyarin and others which is explaining the way that the, by the logical uh, terminology and the logical ways of study of uh, uh, Talmud, which is called in, in the Spanish uh, uh, terminology, iyun, which means, in a way, what we call pilpul. It's the Spanish pilpul, which is iyun. He is not attack he's attacking it only once in this introduction. But basically, most attackers of Talmudic scholars and the study of Talmud in the medieval period and also in this period, in the 16th and the 17th century, are attacking the system of study, but not the study itself and, and, and saying that this study is not enough or is not sufficient in itself because they, they, are, they have no chance to understand the real meaning of the text if they don't study it in Kabbalistic ways. Nobody says that before. They only say you should, you should uh, teach the plain meaning of it and not in, in, in be involved in a, in a very uh, sophisticated way which uh, takes you away. I mean, that's a whole different uh, problem, in my opinion. What they say here is, and he is one of those who says it, that there is that you should not even waste a lot of time on Talmudic schol scholarship. He says it in one place in here that if the person has a problem in understanding the, of the Talmudic text, then he shouldn't waste his time with the Talmud. This is really impossible in a 
regular, normal Jewish text in the medieval period. Who will say that? That, the, that if somebody has a problem, he is not intelligent enough, or his mind is not fitted to this study, then he shouldn't study Talmud. What he says here, and even if you fit to this study, he says, you should study one hour or two a day, and then move to Kabbalistic studies. Now imagine, we are talking about Safed in the 16th century, a center of Jewish academies. The place of Joseph Caro, and we talk in a society in the Ottoman Empire, which brought up many uh, uh, great Talmudic scholars, and dozens of book, books, and the whole ideal of Jewish education is the Talmudic study, and the excellence in Talmudic study. And here comes a person and says, well, fine, Talmudic study is fine, everybody has to know. Bible and oral uh, uh, law, but that's the basis. You should study to a certain degree, but then leave it, because the real Torah is a different Torah, is a different meaning. Yes, sir. Yes. Have you seen the Rambam for philosophy doing something similar? Well, when, uh, the Rambam will never say it. Not to study, he not probably to lower than philosophy. No? That's that's true. That he places it on the on the highest level uh, in Moreno Buchim at the end of the Moreno Buchim, like yeah. But he will never say that what you shouldn't study Talmud uh, all the day long. And he did study himself. Yes. And so, what does it mean, Yeshalesh? Three hours Mishnah, and the rest is Talmud, meaning philosophy. No, I don't think so. I don't think so that that the meaning there is that that you should really every day uh, uh, like study so many hours. This is based on a, an early text. This is based on an early text. And then he paraphrases it. Yes, sure. The emphasis is the end, not the middle. But the emphasis in the middle is limited amount of Torah Shabbat. Okay. Shabbat, okay. No, what you say is that the Kabbalists here do what the extreme philosophers Shabbat. did in, in, in Spain in the 13th century and in Provence. If that is the argument, it's fine for me. I mean, it's fine for me, and I will tell you why. Because there you have really a problem, and you have a controversy. In Jewish society, the famous controversy about the Rambam, and the famous controversy about the study of philosophy, and it ended in the ban, at least partial ban, of philosophy. A spot when they took this uh, uh, to a, an extreme. Now, this doesn't happen here. What we have here is, just a second, what we have here is that nobody, I don't know anybody in Jewish society who in the 17th century attacked this or any controversy which happened after this attitude became public and widespread that they that's yeah, not, uh, the perception. The but this is my point. Yes, this is the point that I will get just... There, there is a huge conflict over these assertions that Kabbalah should come and replace uh, standard rabbinic learning in the 17th and 18th century. Um, this is articulated in uh, post-chapter E discussion. Post-chapter E. Post-chapter yes. E. Yes. yes. It, it does not go unnoticed. Who is against it? He has a against section against the team. Against, against but not Talmidei Chachamim. Now, that's a different point. If I'm not talking about that, yeah. about Kabbalah and Allah, that's a different issue. How do you use Kabbalah in issues of Allah? That's a different story at all. 
but I'm talking about putting Kabbalah on a higher level, saying that, that the inner meaning of the Torah is Kabbalah, and accepting that, and the Ramah is not fighting that. He's fighting, no, not that I know. He, does, he doesn't fight that. He fights the fact, and there also there are differences between uh, in Eastern European Jewry too. There are many who accept it, but just just a second, you wanted to, to know. To what I, to say, I think the, the difference, what sounds similar to me, is saying there's something else, which is the true inner meaning, meaning yes. is higher, and we don't throw out cognitive study, but do it quickly. You know, do it with the digest, or do it a certain limited period of time. Yes. That to me sounds quite similar. However, what you said earlier, that the argument here goes further to say that Talmudic study can be evil and can bring harm, that to me, I don't think... If, yeah. The, the, that if, was what struck me as evil. Yeah, what, what they say here is that it might be evil if you stop there. If you stop there, and if you don't go further, and you don't understand also the inner meaning, it, they but say it explicitly. Evil, yeah, sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Doesn't Sefer HaKamen say that Talmud study is a boil in the intestines mm -hmm. and that the logic is so flawed that were not for the fact that, that the Tanaim came down for a really, mm -hmm. uh, they are really Baalei Merkava, none of it would be true. In other words, the level at its, at its surface meaning, it is totally... A, without any uh, utility. And it's yes. even, I mean, I think, you know, you talk about some kind of growth in your intestines, it's, that's a bad thing. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's true because, it's true because of the, of the, the soul, not because of what you see. So mm -hmm. how is this different? I'm, I will, I, the, 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 the very argument is, is the same, not just in the cane, but, some others too, some extreme Kabbalist habit in the medieval period. But they, they were, these were voices in the, in the wilderness. I mean, nothing happened socially, nothing happened in public. It didn't change society. So we, we say, well, these radical Kabbalists say that, that, uh, and Tishbi liked it, and many others, I mean, uh, uh, be because, I, you see all these uh, harsh things, and so fine. So there is a, a harsh attack on, on uh, you know, on the establishment, on on the on the leadership of the Jewish society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it stayed like a voice in the wilderness. Nothing really changed. Not in Spanish Jewish society. Not even in the circles of the Kabbalists. I'm not saying that this is a new. In, in, in its very existence. What I am saying is, as here comes a person, here comes a person who is saying it loudly, and he has a, a lot of followers, and people come and flock to suffer from all over the Jewish world, mainly from Eastern Europe, and I have a list of a, a long list of people from Italy and from Eastern Europe and from Prague and from other places who come to study Kabbalah and accept all this and go back to their places and they preach the same and nobody in the Jewish society comes and says anything against that in a way to contradict it and say, well, this is a revolution, you can't say it. And this is I think a new phenomena, totally new phenomena. Yes. Uh, even granting what you're saying, is he not here echoing, in fact? Uh, would you argue there's a difference between, I mean, we talked about the financial, book, but the Zohar talks about story that if that's all, you know, we didn't need this, uh, you know, we can make up better stories. Uh, Cordovero in the, you know, is saying much the same thing. Is it really unique to the Lurianic group? No, I'm not saying it's it, that this point is unique to the Lurianic group. I'm not saying that. But you're arguing that the reception is That's specific true. to the reception of the Lurianic group. What I'm saying yeah. is, why not say that, in fact, people are, are, are taking this attitude towards 
the broad context of Kabbalistic ideas, which in fact are there in Cordovero 20 years earlier, and, and it's the publication of the Zohar itself that we should be looking at, rather than specifically Chaim Vital and Svat. Well, I will wait with the answer a little, and that, but still, let's go on. Let's go on. Uh, I, I, I definitely think that the publication of the, Do the Zohar was an important phase in it. I definitely think so. And, but we have to look there too. What were the intentions of the people who made the Zohar public? And the, ba the basic change is making a, 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 an ideology, a whole, uh, uh, the whole Kabbalah making it uh, instead of esoteric, exoteric. This is a, a central point in it. And it has to do what? Well, well, it's it's more com complicated than that, because it happens in Italy in the 1550s, uh, 60s, and it happens at the same time in Safed, in the, all the moral Kabbalistic literature, which is intended to the public. The literature of it's popular. It is it it it, it turns to the public. You don't. Uh, Sure. Well, I'm, if you have the impression that I say that Etz Chaim changed the world, I'm not saying that. What, I, what I'm saying is that this is a, an example. I brought it as an example, as a text. I can't bring here all the text because then it will be a Kabbalistic seminar probably and not, not a seminar on our topic. But in my opinion, this expresses better the change than, for example, the, the people that they printed the Zohar. Although, although uh, the people who printed the Zohar too uh, uh, also have their point, and they say that if you don't, if you don't look at religious life in a spiritual way, and if for the if the Torah has no inner meaning, then uh, all is in vain. I mean, they have the same idea: publishing the Zohar for the public because you have to change the religious character of the Jewish people. But the people who succeeded in changing the religious life of the Jewish people were not the publishers of the Zohar, but these people of the Kabbalistic circle of the Ari and his uh, uh, students. Therefore, I chose this text, but I could have chosen other texts from which express the same major intention. Now, in itself, uh, let, let's go still back to the text. Uh, uh, in, it is not just that the, the, the attack on the, uh, on the Talmud or the fact that, that the Talmud is like the Torah without a soul or the attack on, on certain Talmudic scholars, but is also uh, what what he in, what he offers instead of it. What he says is, in a, in a way, uh, he he builds an image of a of a kabbalistic uh, uh, Torah, which has to do with the personality of Luria. Therefore, I choose this. What he does is, in many ways, in many places, in, I, I counted at least, at least six times, he says that this Torah, this new uh, Kabbalah, which has to do with the revelations of Luria, is connected with the Messianic uh, era. At least six times he says this in the introduction. It can be, you know, an occasional uh, uh, thing. In his opinion, building the image of Luria at the end of, uh, of the introduction and saying that he is the real uh, person who, who met Luria and he is transmitting his teachings. And Kabbalah has to be taught only, not through books, 
but only through oral teaching. This is a, 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 a central point in his whole attitude, pushing the reader to what? To accept, first of all, that Kabbalah is real Judaism, and that real Kabbalah is only taught through oral transmission, and he is the, the right person to transmit it because he is the real student of Luria. And he knows it because he studied with him face to face. Now, this is the whole structure of the introduction. And in my opinion, the feeling of the Kabbalists in Safed was that they, they are living in a turning point in the history. And that turning point is marked by the revelation of the lost secrets of the divine wisdom. They have it. And that is the major point of it. Now, you have some feelings like that also. You could tell me, well, there are former Kabbalists who had the same feelings, okay? That they have the real revelation, okay? This is also not new in itself, that somebody has this feeling. But uh, uh, my opinion is that, that uh, uh, after the expulsion from Spain, and after this concentration of Spanish Jewry, mainly in the Ottoman Empire, uh, they regarded this revelation as revelations as an essential feature of the fulfillment of time and of the process of, of historical growth toward the messianic period. I'm not saying that they are necessarily messianic in their uh, in their theory. And that's the answer for your question of the controversy between Sholem and his school of followers and Idel and his, his uh, uh, followers. I definitely think that that, that uh, uh, discussion or argument went wrong because there is a difference between arguing if Lurianic theory or Kabbalah is a reaction to the Spanish expulsion in its theoretical, uh, 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 theoretical uh, contents. That's it. one point. And they might argue, and you can argue, there are different views about that. Or saying that uh, there is a messianic expectation if you regard the, revel the revelations of the real uh, secret Torah at this period when the Ari was, uh, uh, you know, uh, when he came. And if you consider Ari and his Torah as the secret, the secret uh, meaning of the Torah, that's a whole different issue. <laughs> Right, right. But, but hold, hold I will. T I will get to that immediately. But one, one sec. I, I didn't quite see when, what you were just saying. So you're saying that, in your opinion, this kind of view of Lurianic um, sense of uh, messianism as a revelation of inner Torah, in in what sense is that related? I'm not quite sure how you were differentiating between that and the, the business about Gerush Sparad and... No. and what, what I am saying is there is a difference by saying that the whole system of the Luriani Kabbalah of Galut uh, uh, and, and Tikkun, Tikkun, yes, is a reaction to uh, uh, Spanish... Right. Uh, expulsion, that's a different issue. And that might be a notion if you ac 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 accept Scholem's theory or you don't accept. Uh, so it has nothing to do with it. this point. I mean, I'm not talking now about the inner structure of Luriani Kabbalah. That's a different issue. You might argue about that. What I am saying is that there is clearly in this introduction, that was the reason why I chose this one, for example, is that he has a feeling that this is a messianic uh, occurrence, whatever you think. If you read carefully, 
This is his belief. Now, in not just his belief, we have a lot of people, followers, who feel the same. So that feeling is there. Okay? That, that's, that's not a theory. I mean, that's clear. Now, when we get to the point of how far Luriana Kabbalah was known or not, and that's the other issue, how far this changed society, okay, Jewish society, here again, in my opinion, it went wrong. Why it went wrong? For simple reasons. I really don't care as an historian if people at large had an idea about the theories of Luriani Kabbalah. That's not important for me as an historian. I assume that the Kabbalists, and here again Vital is a very good. I show you that his attitude toward the public is very, very, I mean, is not nice. He's not interested in the public. But that doesn't mean that the Kabbalah after, shortly after, didn't become very popular in other ways. Not on its theoretical level, not on its demand from every Jew to understand the intricacies of Kabbalah and the intricacies of, of if you do so and so, what does it mean uh, in the change of the, the, the higher spheres? It, the Kabbalah became very popular and important from the last decade of the, uh, the, the 16th century for very other reasons at all, and not the Zohari Kabbalah, but especially the Luriani Kabbalah. And how was that? Very easily. If, if you will look into the books printed and the manuscripts and the behavior of people, you will see that all synagogue life changed. All the, the, the Sidur changed, the prayer book changed totally. Even the halachic process changed as a result of Kabbalah. And I can give you some examples. I don't know how much time I have. Five minutes. Five minutes. I will make it very short. For example, if you will look to some response in the, the 17th century, you will see that the, 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 the Talmudic scholar answers and before the answer, he says, L'shem yichud kutsha berichu, I will answer. What does it mean? Why L'shem yichud kutsha? You, what, there is another meaning in your, in your halachic answer. You have to have a special kavana to answer an halachic decision. Why does the, the already in Eastern Europe from the second uh, decade of the 17th century, a, a whole chapter of the Zohar creeps into the Sidur, Brich Shmei, till now. It is all over in all the prayer books. Yes, in, in, in the manuscripts and the print. Why does the Lecha Dodi, which is not, has nothing to do with Luria, enter the Sidur? Okay, also a Kabbalistic mood. The whole Kabbalah Shabbat. Why does like Baomer start? The whole Jewish calendar changes. New, uh, new uh, uh, festivals and holidays, all Kabbalistic. All this is not on the level of theoretical Kabbalah. And all those people had no idea at all about uh, what is Lurianic Kabbalah. But they had a lot of stories about Luria. And this is very, very important in my opinion. Now, if you will look to the printed books in the 16th century Italy, Luria, poems by Luria and stories about him start to be printed in Italy, in Venice, three years after Luria passed away. No, not Sarug at all. Look, no, Luria himself in his name, and look how he is called there. For example, Kavanot, Sefra Kavanot, is the first book of Luria, which is, I mean, I don't know if all is Luria, but at least it, his, his followers say it's Luria, okay? It's printed in Venice in 1620, first time, 1624, second time, and all over. What is Sefra Kavanot? It has to do mainly with prayer. What are the kavanot, the intentions of the prayer? 
and it is all over printed. So people start to pray with Lurianic intentions without understanding those intentions. But still they say it. Now if they even go and slaughter, the slaughtering has a Lurianic intention. So you should say that too. They, 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 the shofar, okay? The shofar is no more just to hear a shofar. From the 17th century on, it has a Lurianic meaning. And you are not supposed in, in the synagogue to just blow the shofar. You, are, you are supposed to add a few sentences. I will ask you, do you understand today those intentions before the shofar uh, blowing? What do they really mean? Nobody cares about that. Maybe some people do care, but most people don't care. Okay? But they still stay, say it. Okay? And this is the real revolution, in my opinion. And, and you're, saying, you're saying most people never did understand the religion. I think so. That's my feeling. So, just, just a second, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. All what I want to say is that there is a, an everything alters and changes mainly on the basis of praxis, which in my opinion as an historian is more important than the fact if some Jews really studied Lurianic Kabbalah or understood it, or whether Sholem is right or Idol is right in the fact that Lurianic Kabbalah was uh, published all over. I don't care about that. And I'm not sure who is right in this, because there are some some things here and there for both sides. But the fact for any historian is, did Jewish society change? And not if a certain ideology or a certain body of, uh, of uh, Torah really became known or unknown to, the, to, the, to a certain scholar. That's a different issue. Yes, please. It seems to me that uh, you said, why did the liturgy change now? Why did the synagogue change? And we don't have the answers to that why. That's yes. not a rhetorical why. We do not have a social history of Kabbalah. Right. Okay. So it's, you can look at this text and say, this is an indicator of how much things change. Fine, I agree with you. But how did that change come about? What was the process by which people were convinced that the truth of Torah and the, the popular people, yes. which is why it could be so radical, what was the process by which they were convinced that the real truth of okay. Torah was Kabbalah without understanding Kabbalah? We don't know that process. Well, we don't know. We may, may guess. We may, may say, my opinion is, if, if that's what you ask, I think that it's, it's a, I am not sure that this was intended. But what happened is that it started in a very different way. It started with a cult of Luria. That's the way it started. With the stories, with the legends of Luria, with Luria becoming a model figure of a sage and a person who had the knowledge of everything. And therefore, he knows better than everybody and in all fields, and we have don't, don't have time to get into that. But it's quite known, all this, okay? And then after Luria became a, a model, and, and naturally he does know the real uh, meaning of, of uh, Judaism and Torah, then naturally the Torah of Luria is, is a Torah based on the Zohar, based on other Luria is why no other Kabbalah in Italy was printed, only Zohari Kabbalah. We should ask the same story. We should ask many, many. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, okay. on this note, which leaves me very dissatisfied, I am unfortunately forced to yield the floor to our next speaker. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Yes.